I'm Howard Clark, and I'm here today with uh, William J. Nittler, Bill Nittler, who uh, for 45 years has been a master gunsmith. During that time, Bill has uh, uh, acquired an international repu reputation as a um, premier shotgun mechanic. And uh, we're making this tape for, to give Bill an opportunity to share with us uh, two or three very specialized procedures and techniques that he's developed over the years uh, with regard to certain uh, certain things that uh, go on with regard to the shotgun world, namely stock bending, choke work, and um, some of the repairs involved to barrels and ribs. Uh, initially, we're going to um, we're going to watch Bill bend the stock in two directions uh, using hot oil. Uh, Bill, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you prepared the stock. First thing we do, we take a piece of burlap like this, about an inch and a half, two inches wide, and wrap it around the stock tightly, and then bind it good with string so it's good and tight. This is to keep the oxygen in the air off of the stock as much as possible so it won't, will not, the oil won't darken the stock. Now this is done, done, and then we have to have a center line in the butt plate or the recoil pad. So I take a piece of basking tape and put it across the recoil pad on the center line and trim it off around the outside edge. Now I'm ready to put the barrel on and put the gun in the stock bender. Oh, we have uh, we have drawings of the, uh, the frame here uh, that will allow other men to duplicate this if they want. Is that correct, Bill? That is correct. Now we got the camera set up such that they can watch the um, the watch the work that the muzzle here, how you use the shims and the uh, the ropes. What are, what are these ropes made of, Bill? Those ropes are uh, airplane uh, tow cable. What I'm doing now is tightening the uh, strap that secures the action to the side of the fixture here. Now I have to sec secure it at the muzzle. You're going to use uh, those little paper business cards as shims? Use uh, blocks and shims. Now, I will measure the center line of the stock to the center line of the action. Center line of the action. And then I check it down here to be sure that the bore and the action are, see I get a little bit too high. Now this has to be absolutely level, obviously, in the frame. What's the base of the frame made of, Bill? The base of the frame is made out of uh, one inch plywood or three quarter inch plywood. You can use either one of them. I think it'd be all right. And the side rails the sides are, 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 are it's two by fours. Two by fours. Now you see that is the center line there. Now I will tighten this strap at the muzzle, at the muzzle end of the gun. So that's the first one that gets tightened down, huh? That's the second one that gets tightened oh, down. Oh, you got the butt already. The action, uh, the action strap is already tightened. Okay. Now you're going to use that C-clamp? In a minute, I'll use a C-clamp to fasten it down so there won't be any, any movement. What kind of oil are you using, Bill? We use boiled linseed oil. At what temperature? And the temperature is about 400 degrees. Now, both the frame and the tank are of your own design? Yeah. They're not commercially manufactured, That's are right. they? I'm going to clamp this muzzle down so that it can't move. 
So now that we know that that gun is in this frame on a center line. Now I'm going to take this same scribe and check my uh, cast off. Okay, Bill, now uh, what's next? I'm going to put this fastener down on the action so that it cannot be moved up. That's good and snug, that's plenty. So it's, it's now, rigidly, it can't move in a vertical, di vertical direction at all. That's correct. How, are you, uh, you going to put the scribe on the, uh, on the center line to see, uh, show the folks? What are you doing now? You're putting cast in, cast off in, I'm or take take some of the cast off out. This okay. Three eighths. Oh yeah. Okay, I can see. Now I'm going to reduce that to about a quarter of an inch. Uh huh. So you'll be putting the shims in underneath the stock, the bottom of the. That is correct. If I want to put cast off in a stock, then I slide this into the fixture and put my shims up here and push down on the stock. Okay, I see that. But now I'm going to put the shims underneath. I have a felt pad there so I won't skip mark the stock and shove it up. Now this is a procedure you could use on the most expensive shotgun in the world without damaging it all, isn't it correct? The truth of the matter is, uh, at Purdy's where they build custom guns for exact measurements, they may bend the stock two or three times while they are making it because when you cut the fibers of the wood, the wood seems to move a little bit. Oh, I see. And they will keep a stock within a 32nd of an inch of the correct dimensions for the shooter. So after the inletting process, then they'll use a hot, hot oil bending technique. They will. They, they, they bend them over there. Okay. Now I'm going to turn the oil on. It will go through here into a, a recess in the fixture and into a pipe and into a, a half gallon measure underneath there. You just have a simple drain underneath the wrist of the stock. That is correct. There goes the oil. And you have uh, just gentle pressure now underneath the, uh, underneath the stock with the wedges, that huh? That's correct. Now you see those bubbles coming out? Yes. That is oxygen coming out of the wood. Hmm. Air, huh? Air coming out of the wood. That oil is hot and it goes right into the wood. Now if you, you use other things, if you use steam to bend the stock, it be, the, the wood becomes brittle. If you use oil, you can bend the stock at half a dozen times and the stock is still uh, limber. It won't, it won't crack and break. Which is very important if you're going to buy a, a piece of wood that uh, costs about five or six hundred dollars to make a stock with. Yeah, you bet. Now, are you going to bend this stock uh, uh, any other direction? I'm going to bend it up and take the drop. Reduce the drop? Reduce the drop in the stock. Can you, can you uh, bend the stock such that uh, you get a different dimension uh, at either end of the, of the cone? That'll, that'll change the dimensions here too. After that stock gets good and warm, it'll, you can move it a little bit better than that. I see your uh, your tank just sort of sits on top of the frame. You can uh, you can slide it around, uh, get it into uh, any position you want there to center the the oil right in the right in the middle of the wrist. It looks like we have a fan going down there to carry away the fumes from this hot oil. And this is nothing more than just straight uh, pure linseed oil, huh? Boiling the linseed oil. You can buy it in the paint store. How long is this procedure going to take now, Bill? Oh, I'd say about 15, 20 minutes. You're just going to set the timer on 15 yeah. so you know where you're at? Yeah. And uh, at what point do you uh, start to put some real pressure on the stock now? Probably after, what, four or five minutes? Yeah, or? five minutes. So. Then once you... Uh, once you've completed, uh, you've got this, this, this stock moved as far as you want. Do you have to go any further to get any spring back? Uh? Yeah, there's a certain amount of spring back in, in a stock. So you can allow for that. You overbend them a little bit and 
uh, that'll come and when it, you take every, take it out of the fixture, it'll go back to just about where you want it. Uh, if you're uh, if you, if you want to put about three eighths inch per permanent set in there, would you overbend maybe what an, uh, an eighth of an inch, say? Almost an eighth of an inch. Wood is different. If you get American wood, it'll spring back more than some of the other French walnut and the Circassian walnut. It has coarser fibers and and uh, it'll spring back more. Same thing is true with the drop. Boy, that stuff smells. You've got to keep that fan going good. Make sure you've got plenty of ventilation in here. That, that's right. How many years have you been doing this now, Bill, this uh, bending these stocks? Oh, off and on, maybe 30 years. But the last uh, 20 years, I've bent uh, a lot of stocks. I, I see you keep a record over here. Of the stocks since when? 1964? 69, oh, 69 when I moved down here. Oh, I see. It's 69. Right there, but I used to bend them there in San Francisco, too. Looks like uh, an average of maybe uh, 20 a year for 18 years or so. Something pretty close, 10 or 15 in there. I haven't counted them up. But I was always interested in knowing how many stocks I would have to would bend. People come in with custom guns that they bought someplace and they don't fit them. Then they bring them to me and I bend the stock so it'll fit the, the guy that bought it. Yeah, I see you've got uh, Holland and Holland over there in the safe, a couple of Merkels, uh, Model 21s, all the finest guns in the world. They don't seem to intimidate you. <laughs> that's, that's right. Purdy's. I got a Purdy over there, too. A 20 gauge Purdy that came in the other day, but that's not a stock job, that's a barrel job. We're going to get to see you work on the, the barrels on that Purdy, huh? A little later on this tape? Yeah, yeah. We'll have to uh, work out some kind of a program for that because that is really a tough job. You want to talk about that for a minute? Sure. When the customer brought the gun in, and I took a look at it, you can see that the barrels were bent down. And then there was something wrong with the bore. So I mic the bore, and it, it might Somebody had been trying to do something with the bore. Way oversized in some areas. And mind you, this was a, a gun that looked like new. The barrels had been chopped off, and somebody had tried to choke it a little bit at the muzzle. And um, I asked the customer, I said, well, does this gun shoot low? He said, yeah, about 11 inches. So I said, well, <laughs> it looks like it would. The barrels are actually bent, huh? Actually bent, yeah. So they've got to be straightened. Well, I think, didn't, it, didn't you mention they were also out of round? They may be out of round because it looks to me like somebody bent it over a over a porch step in a clubhouse or something. Twenty thousand dollar shotgun. My goodness. Now the, the now I'm going to tighten this strap up a little bit. See, I can move that pretty good now. Oh yeah, starting to loosen up. Well, now, the English use this technique uh, uh, to a very considerable extent, but it's not done in America uh, much. Uh, why do you think that is, Bill? Well, because uh, they just, uh, the gun stock makers that came over to this country from England uh, never did uh, develop a setup like this. Well, Shotgun fit is extremely important. Maybe the English uh, attribute a little more uh, to that than we do. Is that possible? That's quite, quite likely. I mean, precision shotgun fitting to a, to a customer. They make a great deal out of it. We're about 10 minutes into the procedure now. 
We've got about 10 minutes to go, you feel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me reach over here and get this caliper. Now this is set for one and five sixteenths. I'm supposed okay, you're to bend your drop now. Yeah, I'm going to work on that drop a little bit. So we're bending the stock in two directions at the present time. We're, we're, we're bending it up, and then we're also bending it uh, away from us, changing the drop and changing the cast off. Yeah. You have to be careful not to get your that oil on your hands or your arms or anything because it'll take the hide off. It's pretty hot. Okay, what are you, what are you doing now? You're tightening up. Uh, I'm tightening up the strap. That okay, so we're bending the stock up away from us here. You gotta put some more in if I make it or not. So, Bill, have you ever uh, broken a stock with this uh, technique? No, I haven't. I have to be pretty careful. I have to watch the grain in the stock before I bend it. Are there any stocks that you would you would not that you would would not work on because the grain uh, went the wrong way? Uh, have, you ever, have you ever seen that happen? Yes, I've seen it happen. Or if you try and bend the stock too much. You can bend them three quarters of an inch or an inch if the grain is uh, all right. The grain needs to uh, come fairly straight down through the grip there, I guess. That is, that is right. I'm going to do something from it. I notice you've made a notation here. You always do that? You always have on here the dimensions I want to bend it to. Usually I will... Uh, Put the dimensions on there that it is now. I can do that. I can measure this thing. That way you never forget what you're doing. One and nine sixteenths. Well, now let me see. This is a, uh, I think it's a French gun. It doesn't even have a maker's name on it. It looks like a very fine gun. Side lock gun, I believe there yeah. is. Full side lock gun. I may not be able to bend this all the way up as far as I want it. So you'll have to make, what, uh, two shots at it? I may. Well, I think I can make it all right. I checked my temperature here. That fan kind of cooled off my tank more than I wanted to. Yeah, but it does something else that you do want it to, which yeah. is blow those fumes out of here. Oh boy, yeah. I'm not kidding. Okay, here we go again. Linseed oil at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. For about 20 minutes on that stock, and it turns it into... Kind of rubber, huh? Well, I mean, it softens it up so you, you can move it. Now I'm going to move this a little bit. Okay, so you've got about quarter half of that. Uh, yeah, I've got just about a quarter of an inch now. That's not what I want. I see. He wanted you to uh, change the cast off from three eighths to a quarter of an inch. That's correct.
Do you ever consider uh, building an oil return system here for your tank? Uh, that is uh, an automatic one, not a manual one. It would be nice if you were doing this all day long, every day in the week, but it isn't pay to have a very elaborate system for uh, just an occasional stock bending job. I had to bend quite a few stocks for a man last year because I bent about three or four guns for him and they were perfect. He shot very well with them and he went to South America and he was surfing in the ocean. He broke his left shoulder. Uh oh. And then he couldn't mount the gun the way he used to. So we had to bend the stocks in a different direction for him. We got that all finished up, and in the meantime, he bought a couple more shotguns. Let me guess. His shoulder got well, and you had to bend it back. Yeah. His shoulder got well, and he, he went to a, a shotgun instructor for skeet and trap, and continental trap, and all that sort of thing. And uh, his, the comb was too low. By that time, his shoulder had healed up. So he, he started holding the gun correctly, the way he used to. <laughs> so then I had to bend them all over again. So these stocks, this is a second or third bend for this stock. Oh, I see. This is one of his guns, huh? Yeah. Uh, how many times can you use this uh, oil, Bill? <laughs> well, this is very unusual to, to bend the stock three times. Uh, but uh, I don't know why you can't bend them three more times. Now the oil has to be changed every four or five times. You should change it. Well, it gets to stinking pretty bad. Oh, I check the comb again. Almost there. You're almost there? Almost there. Which dimension on the comb do you consider uh, the most critical? Well, the one at the, at the peak of the comb. The peak of the comb yeah. rather than at the, uh, the, at the heel. heel huh? oh, I brought that heel up from, that was one and five eighths to begin with. I brought it up to almost two, uh, two and five eighths. I brought it up to about two inches. Okay. See, I read my ruler wrong when I originally. Okay, we've had the oil on for 15 minutes now, huh? Yeah. I think I just about finish it up. You get a little bit more movement about every uh, three or four minutes out of the, uh, with the stock, and then when you get to the, uh, the dimension you want, uh, then you stop, is that correct? That's correct. There, that's it. That's one and five sixteenths now. And it'll spring back to about one and three eighths. And that's that's the dimension he's that's the asked for. We're after, yeah. Okay. Now we're shutting the oil down. Now you're gonna have to let this set a while. How how long are you gonna have to let this uh, stock set, Bill? Well, I'll let this stock set overnight. Okay. But first I'm gonna put an infrared lamp on it to kind of dry it on the inside after I get it cleaned up here. Uh huh. Are you going to take that burlap off now? Or? Yes, I'm going to take the burlap off. Now, after you after you take this stock out of here tomorrow, then um, you you'll have to do some cleaning, I presume, because that oil looks like it's pretty close to the action. Some oil gets in the action sometimes, and you always have to check it all and find out for sure. And what do you what do you use then to clean the action with? Just plain uh, good cleaning solvent. I use poppies or good, something good like Good gas. That. I use a good high grade gasoline. White gas. White gas. Yeah. It has no detergents in it. What about the uh, what about the checkering on the stock? Do you, uh, yeah, well, that gets, gets it gets all washed out of the checkering too. What That's you, what I'm going to do now. I meant here. 
Does that does that uh, oil kind of gunk up the checkering if you don't? Yeah, if oil? you don't if you don't get that oil out of the checkering, it, it it dries in there, and then you have to take a checkering tool and cut it out. Are you going to use any special solvent to clean it now on the outside the checkering? Yes, I will. I will use just regular paint thinner that dissolves the uh, the linseed oil very rapidly. Okay. Now I'm going to empty this. You've got this frame very level so that the uh, the drain in the uh, in the bottom part of the frame right under the wrist uh, collects all the oil and it drains straight out. It doesn't seem to be running forward or backward at all. Now I'm going to take a level. Sharp pocket knife. Cut the string and the burlap. Being careful not to gouge a big hole in the stock. Well, you know, I've 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 bought a couple of guns in uh, England and uh, talked to some of the the dealers over there, and they they uh, they wouldn't think of selling you a shotgun that didn't fit you perfectly, and and uh, they'll uh, they'll accommodate you uh, over a weekend. So they they most of those people must have access to one of these uh, hot oil uh, bending. Uh, yeah, procedures right. if they don't have one in their own store. That's correct. It's pretty hot. Pretty hot? Yeah. I see you're pouring the paint thinner right through the Copper tubing spigot you use. Yeah, because it it dries in there and then you can't use it anymore. Just going to pour the paint thinner right over the top of the the stock there. Is that pretty hot still, Bill? No. Yeah, it's, it's still it's warm. Let me see if I get a clean rag here. a pretty piece of wood in that uh, particular stock. That's a very nice piece of wood. Genuine French, I suppose. I suppose. I don't know what the make of the gun is. It's not on the uh, barrels or on the receiver any place. But you thought it was French, huh? I, I presume it was French, yeah. I, uh, the engraving looks like Belgian and French engraving. You see, that stock is nice and clean. Uh, Bill's put a infrared heat lamp uh, right over the top of the wrist of the stock now to try to get the drying procedure uh, started quickly. He's worked uh, both with and without the heat lamp, and he feels that uh, the use of the heat lamp for up to three hours will accelerate the drying process by as much as maybe eight or ten. Uh, over in England, the old timers over there, after they bend the stock, they take a cast iron brick and get it red hot, and then they hold that under the stock. 
so that the warm air will come up over the top and, and dry it out a little bit. I uh, see. They're doing the same thing that you're doing here with the infrared lamp. That is correct. It starts the drying from the inside. Yeah. But yeah. They, they use a, a hot brick? Well, I, they used to use it. Now, that was in Harry Lawrence's day, which was a long time ago. That was before around World War I uh, days. When he was working in the shop at Purdy's. So, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. I'm going to take this gun out of the stock bending fixture, and before I do that, I set this caliper at one and three eighths. That's the dimension of the comb that I want to again get to when the, this job is finished. First, we'll take this bar off and the wedge under the stock for the drop, for the cast off I should say. Then I'll loosen up the strap that pulls the stock up to give me the correct drop. Okay, so you have no pressure at all on the no stock there. At all. Now I'll take the calipers they just barely touch the comb. The reason okay. I use calipers is because the light isn't too good. Sometimes you'll make a mistake in reading the scale. The scale. Uh -huh. And I will also measure. Look at that. <laughs> the cast off. Right smack on. And it's perfect. Quarter of an inch. So when we get these things out of the way, so we won't scratch the gun. So now you're going to take it out of there and pull the stock off and clean the action. That's right. Let's loosen up this top clamp here. I'm going to take this thing clear off. Now that, that little bolt is against the action there is really not cinched down too tight, is it? Yeah. No, it's just uh, keep it from springing up more than anything. Yeah, keep it absolutely solid while it's in the fixture. Now comes the action clamp. I've done a little better job in fixing this clamp up so it'll go very quickly. Now, I'll pull this down here a little bit and take the C clamp off the muzzle. And now comes the clamp that holds the, the muzzle up against the back of the frame. Now she should just slip out, huh? Slip right out. Just put right forward there. That a boy. All right. Now. Now the stock is bent. And all we have to do now is to check the action on the inside to see that uh, the oil has gotten into the into the uh, action itself. Okay. Because it frequently gets in behind the safety here, and then. Uh, the customer wants to take the safety off to shoot at the target or something and it, uh, it's stuck, then you're in trouble. Right. And you, uh, you'll clean that with uh, Gasoline. white gas, huh? Yes. Coleman fuel. That's right. That's what I use because it's volatile, number one, and because it has no uh, detergents in it. Now that's what will be out of the way. Now I'm going to take the action apart and uh, do that little job. That really doesn't have anything to do with the stock bending, so I guess no. we're pretty well near the end of this tape, huh? That's right. Anything else you'd like to say in sort of a wrap-up? Uh, precautions uh, people might might look out for if they are going to attempt this procedure themselves? The only thing I can suggest is be sure and keep the shop and the, uh, the oil area around this thing 
real clean because if you should ever have a fire or anything like that, you'd be in a lot of trouble. And so far, I've never had a bit of trouble. I have a bit two or three hundred stocks in my time. Okay, very good. It. Well, thank you, Bill. This uh, this barrel, uh, Bill, you you are saying now, uh, this gentleman wants to shoot 16-yard singles exclusively at trap. That's right. And so you're opening the choke up to accommodate that. Yeah, I'm gonna regulate the choke and bring it up there. If I just take the choke out of the choke cone, out of the muzzle, he gets a tight pattern on the inside. He doesn't get anything on, on the outside edge. Okay. So I have to do the whole job over again, so he can have even distribution out there in a 30-inch circle. I see. Okay. And now you're taking, uh, this is a chrome line barrel, so you're taking chrome out of the barrel, That's huh? Right. You've got to do that before you can adjust the choke. That's before I can, uh, yeah, read my uh, choke curve in there. See, I'm sliding this back and forth in the barrel. And the mandrel is turning over. Look, the, the mandrel has a, uh, uh, honing stone. Uh, yeah. This dial on the machine shows me that the stone is, it's got pressure on the stone and how true I hold the the barrel with the mandrel. Let's sit back and show them that dial so the camera can get it here. Yeah. Now this will take uh, normally maybe uh, an hour. That's that's correct. Uh, Probably an hour. You've uh, you've worked on this a uh, little bit earlier, so that this dial moves the stone up in the mandrel. These dials are are uh, calibrated in one tenth of a thousandth of an inch. Who makes this uh, honing machine, Bill? Uh, I manufacture it back in St. Louis, Missouri by the name of Sunnen, S-U-N-N-E-N, Sunnen okay. Honing Machines. And you use their mandrels and their cutting oil also? Their mandrels, their stones, their cutting oil, everything. They made, they built these mandrels especially for me, for shotgun barrel work. They're all, the, the, uh, the mandrels are all custom made. Hey, you had worked earlier on this barrel, so you were saying you thought it should be pretty well finished with, uh, with the uh, de-chroming, if you will. Is that correct? That's correct. This stone down here is a marker that tells me where my stone is in the barrel. I see. You know, I, I can also tell by the feel. So that tells me exactly where the stone is. I notice you built yourself a uh, foot treadle. Yeah, this is this is not factory. This this I had a plumber make this up for me. This extension to catch the oil and everything in. So when yeah. you press down, why the uh, machine goes? When you take your foot off, why it stops? Yeah, it's it's like a clutch, I guess. Huh? That's correct. Yeah. That would be enough of that. Okay, you think you've got enough of that chrome out of there to go ahead and work on that uh, choke now? Yeah. So then the uh, next step is, uh, is the hand reaming operation? That is the next step. Kleenex, tissue paper, you told me you thought that worked better than almost anything else. Sure, it works better than patches and it's a lot cheaper. See the welcome out of the barrel? And the oil is kind of black too. So why, why do you say it works better? It, uh, well, it's more absorbent. I see. They forgot to open the door. Shut it off before they open the door or something. See how clean that is? That first <laughs> one wiped it out nicely. You're right. I think that may actually work better than patches. And this tip is what they call a jagged tip for English rods. I got 
have to use that wooden rod because it's a 34 inch barrel. Otherwise, I use this aluminum rod with the tip on it. Uh huh. Jag, they call that. Yeah, I've seen that. Now we're going to set up to hand ream. Correct. Now, what's, what size is that reamer? It's a 728 reamer. Okay. I've got these reamers made up of different sizes 728, 730, 732, 734, and 738. I'm going to put a guide on this rod to keep that reamer concentric with the bore. Is that another one of your little uh, oh, yeah. uh, home designs? Yes, yeah, fine. Everything has to be done concentric with the board. Right. I would hope so. But we'd be shooting around corners with Paul Bunyan. That's right. Okay, now you told me the board was 727, and the choke is 697. And when you finished, you anticipated being out around 729 on the bore, and uh, the choke around 7... 712, which gives you about 17 thousandths choke, right. plus or minus a couple of thousands, whatever it works out. Whatever it makes, it makes it shoot good. Right. Now this is a reaming operation. That's all, all your reaming is done by hand. All reaming is done by hand. This generally takes me uh, at least uh, uh, half an hour, maybe. Uh -huh. It all depends upon the beer owner. Other problems that come into the picture, how long the choke cone is, it's in the barrel, and things like that. Let's see if we get a good look at that reamer with the camera now. You do some grinding on this yourself, don't you? These reamers have a parabolic curve, concave, convex, parabolic curve. That mm, work that I worked out as a, as a choke cone that is the most efficient. Uh huh. When I first started doing this, I didn't have enough curve. And then I had too much curve. And I compromised and it came out real good. And since then I've been running all my reamers with that that particular curve. And I don't think you can see that curve in that reamer. No, but I can see that the curve goes in this direction. Now, you also have to taper back away from the leading edge of the cutter in order to keep it from hanging up on the barrel. Is that correct? Right, yeah. And when you get these, they're straight. They're straight, straight from something. Yeah. I don't get these from Sun, I buy these from a machine, a machinery supply place. I see, but they are straight. Yeah, they're straight. And then you have to put them on the grinder and grind the proper curve. You've got a, you've got a, a jig that you, uh, you use when you grind Yeah, those. I've got a picture I made up for the, for the lathe, and I use my tool post grinder on the lathe. I see, okay. Well, maybe a little later you can show us how that works. No, I have to get another reamer out. Okay, now, now you just re reamed it with the uh, the 728. Uh, what will be next? Well, before I started to do anything to this gun, I mic the the bore at the muzzle, and it was seven six ninety seven. Six ninety seven. And then I reamed the choke out until I had about. 12 or 14 thousandths constriction. This is a, a Sterrett taper gauge. It's a very accurate gauge. It saves me a lot of time in, in micing the barrel with a barrel mic. Um, what, what size uh, reamer will you use now? I finished reaming it to 712, I think it is. No, 708. It's now 708. Now when you finished with this uh, this polishing step, then you shoot the gun, is that correct? I, no, this is not polishing yet. This is some more honing, and then comes the final polishing. And yeah, I may even go to a cork stone to finish the polishing. I see. Now, I'm, I'm working on this, these curves in here now. Can you see that dial gauge? How it, how it? It tells you when you're. Told me I'm, I'm when you're stone. in the bore section and when in, when you're in the uh, yeah. choke cone section. Right. You only polish in one direction here. 
That's right, you can't win the thing if it seizes. Years ago, how did they do this work, uh, Bill? They used a lead lap on a rod and just drug it back and forth in the barrel and keep rotating it. Endless hours, huh? Days. Are they, uh... I don't know they, what they, they do now. the English using uh, holding machines or are they still lapping by hand? I, I really don't know. I haven't been over there for a long time. I, it's got a new shop, I understand, but I, I have never been to that new shop. Purdy's, uh, you're speaking of? Yeah, Purdy's. Uh, I know I bought a Wesley Richards, and they certainly didn't go anywhere near this trouble to uh, choke the gun. Uh, they shot it at a pattern board after they reamed it out to a particular dimension, and uh, the pattern looks all right at that point while they ship it. That's it. Yeah, they don't, they're not worried they about holding at all. Barrel regulators anymore. They don't, uh, you see, I've taken out about two thousandths of an inch there. You're practicing a lost art here, Bill. Yeah, with modern machinery, huh? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to turn this whole thing around. And do it from the muzzle a couple of times too. If I can. For many years, you were the only uh, authorized, uh, uh, the only mechanic authorized in the United States to do factory warranty repairs on Purdy's. Is that correct? That's correct. Old Harry told me he would he would send me a gun. To, you know that, that was already over here, and the customer needed some little thing done to it. He would have me do it rather than send it back, send to, it London, back to the right? factory. Well, that's what, didn't this fellow that was in here brought that pretty in the other day say that he had called and talked to them and that they had recommended he bring it in here? That's correct. Where are you at now, though? About finished with this phase of the polishing. Yeah, that's the right phase. Yeah. That's 710. I got a little thousand to take out. Why don't I try that with the finishing stone? Okay, so you're down to 710. You're going to uh, 712. That means you've got a thousand on each side and that's cutting it pretty thin. This stone is a, a fine polishing stone. Polishing stone? Yeah, called J95. So the top dial puts the, puts the tension on the on the stones right at the surface of the metal and this tells you when you're moving yeah. moving from right. choke section into the bore section. I rotate the barrel in my hands so that there won't be uh, any chance of it doing anything out of round. I imagine by now you can you can tell to a large extent what you're doing just by the feel of yeah. the barrel of your hands. There. You have to get a feel for it. You do this for 30 years while you'll learn. <laughs> so when you regulate a single tube, by the time you strip the chrome out, if it happens to be a chrome line barrel, you probably got uh, uh, maybe somewhere between two and three hours of work inside that barrel. That's correct. Before you even shoot it the first time. That's right. 
This is about a day's work or more in, in each barrel. Shooting and is that maybe you including ca counting 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 yeah. pellets and the patterns and so on? Yeah. You count every pellet, right? And yeah. every pattern you shoot. That's right. Unbelievable. Well, you've developed an awful lot of uh, uh, tools to help you uh, do the things you want to do here. I guess the next uh, step is uh, an automatic pellet counter. <laughs> yeah. I get a boy to do that, huh? Why not a girl? <laughs> That's why. Right. You know, uh, they want their share of everything now. Discrimination. Right. I hadn't heard about that yet. That's because you spent 45 years in this shop. Yeah. I don't like the way that stone feels in the barrel. I'm, and maybe you have to put a new stone on it. OK, you're, uh, you're uh, putting the finishing touches on here, Bill, with a polishing stone. That's right. Polishing the bore. What's that clock say up there? Polishing the bore. The clock says 218. Five minutes. Can I change my spring tension to eight? Now, when you finish with this, can you draw us a picture of what this uh, this thing was going to look like on the inside? That's when right, you sure. With it? I can cut the barrel in half too and show you. <laughs> Customer might not like that. What you call a cutaway, huh? A cutaway model, yeah. What stone have you got on there now, Bill? Cork stone. They call this glass with cork. So that's what they, they make a special cork stone. Special cork stone. Uh, do you do any uh, of the uh, the old uh, uh, lead hand lapping at all? Oh yeah, yeah, that comes later. You just barely have enough mandrel there for a 34-inch barrel. Yeah. I don't get many 34-inch barrels to do, to tell you the truth. I did it for a short time ago. There's uh, four minutes. You've got one minute to go, huh, mm -hmm. on the polishing? Mm -hmm. Over the years, you've, uh, you've apparently concluded that five minutes is sufficient mm -hmm. to do this, huh? Color the oil coming out of there, uh, Howard. Color the oil. Yeah, how uh, the difference? Uh, yeah. Different color down. That's yeah, it's a little darker. That's from the stone in the barrel. Is the oil's darkening up because we're pulling off the grits from the stone? Mm-hmm. There's a separating uh, unit in the in the in the coolant tank. That gets most of the chips out. It oh, I see. It cleans it up. So the uh, yeah. That's why they have to have 12 gallons. Hmm. There's your five minutes. I a few more chips in here.
like the way that one looks, do you? Yeah. On top of your hand, yeah. But these these lines here indicate the inside diameter of the barrel, and this is a choke curve. First is a concave curve, and then a convex curve, then a little straight section right at the muzzle. Yeah. <coughs> Actually. This constricts the shot, just like the nozzle in a water hose. So that it comes in like this, and the shot column is traveling at about 12, 1300 feet a second. So when it, it gets this so quick, it's, those pellets roll over each other, and when they go out of the barrel, they're spinning. And this is what makes them fly true, is this spinning action. The choke cone makes them spin. If you have a straight barrel like that, and they don't spin, they just go out there in a big glob. With a bunch of flat sides. Huh? With a bunch of flat sides. Yeah. Well, you were telling me about a step. What, what is the step? Uh, the little, little step that I'm going to lap in here is just at the beginning of the choke. I can't get my honing stones in here to make this perfectly straight. So I'll straighten this right up to within about one thousandth of an inch of where the curve starts. And uh, you'll see in there just a little, little tiny ring. And the barrel up to that point will be true, and then comes your constriction. First with a concave curve, then a convex curve, then the straight section. That is correct. The straight section is what, about a half an inch long? The straight section, maybe three-eighths of an inch, maybe only a quarter of an inch in a choke that has to open up like this for 34 yards. And the step will be about an inch and a half from the muzzle. About an inch and a half, an inch and three-eighths, something like that. This is what you've determined the uh, choke configuration of your, uh, basically your own design? That no, it's what you learn from experience. I mean, uh, uh, isn't my ideas at all. It's just what you come up with. <coughs> Pardon me. What you come up with from doing these things over and over and over again. If you want a 90% choke cone, then you start it back here, maybe an inch and three quarters from the muzzle. And you have a straight section out of here, maybe a half three quarters of an inch, three quarters of an inch. Oh, I see. You see, after they get, then you, you guide, you're guiding the shots, what you're actually doing. Started into the cone, the cone a little earlier. Yeah, and so you, you don't get that abrupt change. You get, you get the same, you get the same abrupt change, but you get this little longer straight section and a little farther back from the muzzle. And then a little more uh, 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 curve in here. And not so much up here. This curve, this convex curve, helps to control the spread of the pattern. This one apparently gets them all toward the center, originally. I see. Now, what, what, uh, what shot size do you recommend patterning? Whatever the man likes to shoot with. If you like to shoot with sevens and a half and eights, I'd recommend it for sevens and a half and eights. If you like sixes or fives or fours. Or so a waterfowl, a duck gun, you'd regulate with fours? Maybe fours, fours yeah, anything you want. A uh, 10 gauge goose gun, you might regulate with BBs or. Whatever. I had a 10 gauge uh, Magnum, I regulated, and I got uh, 85 and 90 percent patterns with uh, twos and fours. Twos and fours. Yeah. That's what that was that old uh, uh, Ithaca automatic. Oh, the automatic. automatic. Sounded like a cannon going off in the hills up there. Oh man, it was it was something. <laughs> what am I looking for now? Yes, that oh my goodness sakes, alive. Holy Toledo. Like polished glass in there. Whew. Now you're going to put the lap the step in there, huh? Yeah. I see pictures of uh, Bing Crosby hanging around here. I guess he was a, a friend of yours for many yeah, years. Yeah, he used to come to my shop in San Francisco. Did you say uh, you've done some work for uh, the uh, Mr. Was it Dean Witter? Oh, Dean Witter, yeah, Dean Witter, and 
uh, Vern Wolfson and a lot of those guys that used to go on safaris. David Packard? Packard was in my shop uh, when I was out in the Sunset uh, District there. He came in one day with a scope mounting problem. Give me another picture for him. Well, in 45 years, I guess you could meet a lot of people. <laughs> you could meet a lot of people. Nice people. Let me see now. You, uh, you've regulated a lot of guns for uh, live bird shooters. The, uh, yeah, pigeon shooters. Pigeon shooters, huh? Mm -hmm. What kind of a, what kind of a pattern do they, uh, do they seem to prefer? Do, they, do, do you notice any consistency in what those guys want? Oh yeah, they, uh, they, uh, the good shots are all 34 yard. Handicapped shooters, you know, and um, they have to have a, a good 75% pattern for me at 40 yards, at 34 yards. They're on the 34 yard line. The bird comes out, he's 34 yards from where he's standing. So they want 75% patterns. They need a 75% pattern. You know, I used to put about 165 to 175 eights in the outside circle so it should really be it was a good bird gets uh, load it's an ounce and a quarter load too that's an ounce and a quarter they, they used to shoot an ounce and a quarter uh, three and a quarter one and a quarter eights and seven and a half i, have to do I would imagine they're some of the fussiest uh, shotgun well, shooters yeah. in the world they are uh, they, sh they shoot for a lot of money yeah i guess Entry fees alone. Targets alone used to cost them a dollar a piece. <coughs> Fifteen to fifteen to twenty thousand dollar entry fees for some of these Is that big right? shoots. Yeah. I never knew how much the entry fees were. I know these. Yeah, I'll make a lead lap for this. You have to make a lap each time. Almost. You need a you need a lap for each. For each bore size in well, thousands of an inch, I guess. Huh? They wear out too. They, they don't last too long. I mold these lead blanks. Uh huh. And then I drill them and thread them. First, you're dressing up the face. Is this a special lead, Bill? No, just pure lead. 728. So what you got? No. The end flat section there, then, is the lap itself. Yeah, the end section there is what I use for the lapping. Turn this lead lap down on the end of this rod, lapping rod. I've allowed about almost 20 thousandths of an inch in diameter because I'm going to make this whole section down here uh, rough so it'll pick up the abrasive. It's all roughed up. That'll pick up the abrasive. Now I'm set a ruler here an inch and a half from the muzzle. I'll say it again. I'm going to set this depth gauge to an inch and a half so I can stop that thing an inch and a half from the muzzle. Right 
That's a stop that you're putting on there? That's right. <coughs> You've got it adjusted such that the lap is right uh, at the beginning of the the choke section where you want to put that step, huh? Yeah. I want to use some abrasive compound here. Put that in there a little bit. This is a hundred crystalline. I'm going to rough it out with this. Okay, so you've heard you got kind of a mixture of the, the grinding compound and the oil. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've roughed up the uh, section of the lap that you're going to. That's right. You're going to cut the, uh, the step with. We're going to lap a step in there now. Okay, we're going to lap that last little part of an inch before the choke cone. That still has a curve in it. Say, say that again now. You're gonna last the, the lap. lap. Straighten out the barrel, the last the part of an inch, it, before it goes into the choke cone. Okay. So you can open it up from the barrel. That's right. Tighten it up. The muzzle yeah. and yeah. and tighten the lap in the barrel. You're just going to cut a slot in there, and then you can drive the wedge in from the muzzle and uh, tighten that lap right in the barrel. How in the world did you ever figure that out, Bill? Well, Harry told me how to do that. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. This is your friend Harry Lawrence at Purdy's? That's right, yeah. I used to measure every good gun barrel that came in the shop. And I kept records on it for a long time. One time when Harry Lawrence was here, I said, well, there's no two of them alike. He said, that's right. And that's why you have to make a lap for each one. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Like. The production guns are pretty much alike, like the automatics and some of your pump guns. Your so. pump guns. But all these they're, uh, they're pretty much alike. But the high grade uh, double guns are yeah. all handmade, so they'll all, they'll all vary. I used to like the barrel. Uh, Measurements, eight one inch apart, you know. Keep records on them. I'm right? trying to find out and, uh, how they did it. And Harry told me how to do this. Well, this is a, is a, is a step, a, a pretty in, innovation, or, or no, one of yours? It's what they, they do at the factory. They, they do these things. They, they've learned over the years that they do this. It does a certain thing to the pattern. This is a basically uh, a purdy style choke. Then that is correct. I, uh, my good friend Harry, I asked him one time, "Do you tell people what that you do to a gun?" Oh, he says, "Yes, we do. We know they're not going to start making purdies tomorrow." <laughs> So they don't mind telling them. But he's helped you uh, a lot over the years, I guess. Oh, yeah, uh, he's encouraged me. I'll tell you a funny one. You think this is crude and primitive. You mean you're. But when I used to bend stock stocks. Bending technique here? When I started bending stocks, I was heating the oil over a camp stove in the basement of Roost Brothers in big coffee pots <laughs> and pouring it over the <laughs> and they can smell that linseed oil all, all the way up to the seventh floor floor to the cafeteria that's probably why you wound up working for Abercrombie <laughs> no no they they uh, they they refused I heard later that 
the uh, clerks, were, the uh, salespeople were complaining about it. They said, no, no, don't touch that gunsmith. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't bother the gunsmith. I like this barrel now. You finished uh, lapping in the step, huh? The bore is 730. Very true. There, right there. Starts. Stroke section. It goes to 7.13, from 7.30. It's 18 thousandths in the friction, isn't it? From 7.30 to... 17. It goes to 7.13, but it's 18 thousandths in the friction. Uh, this is a pattern sheet that we have shot today at 32 yards to determine what the pattern was after we did the work on the barrel. This is a, this is a template we use <coughs> to mark the pattern sheet with so we can count them. This is a 20 inch circle and inside is a, this is a 30 inch circle and inside is a 20 inch circle that will um, have about the same number of squares in each circle so we know about how uniform the pattern is. This is the outside circle, and you can see from the count that there's only 127 pellets in the outside circle. On the inside circle, the 20-inch circle, there's 236. This shows you uh, the, the ratio of the pellets in the pattern sheet that you expect at, at, at your shooting distance, 32 yards. So you're roughly two to one. You're heavy in the center. They're very heavy in the center, and we have to open this, change that choke cone around a little bit so we have a much better distribution between the 20 inch circle and the 30 inch circle. Well, you have, you've got, uh, you have a 78 percent pattern. Seven. That's that's about what you were looking for in terms of total number of pellets, right? That's right. But the distribution isn't yet quite what you want. That is correct. And the, the, the pattern was also shooting just a little bit high. A little bit high. Uh-huh. So you can adjust that? We have to adjust that. Um, I'll show you how that's done. I notice you shoot the pattern and then draw the circle. Well, that's because when you're standing up and shooting these targets, it's hard to always get it right in the perfect center. But you can find the center of the pattern uh, pretty easy Good. when you lay the template on there. That's correct. Okay. So it's, uh, it's back to uh, the honing machine now? No, I have to do a little work on that curve in there. I have to do that by hand. Oh, with the lead lap? Then I'll, then I'll finish it up with the uh, honing machine a little bit. Okay. Okay, very good. This is the muzzle end of the gun, and the uh, shot, shot column is moving in this direction. Now, this is very exaggerated, obviously, but it illustrates what's happening in there. This is basically a Purdy-style choke. Uh, you've got two cur curves what they call a convex curve here and a concave curve here with a step at this point. And basically the theory is as the shot charge moves forward it engages the step which causes it to, uh, to vibrate or shock which uh, then separates the pellets a little and allows them then to form as they move through the two curves. Um, basically because we have uh, a fairly dense pattern. He's taking a little bit off the shoulder right here on what they call the convex curve. He feels that it's too abrupt, which is causing too much of a centering of the pattern. If you can follow that. This stone is a little finer grit than the other one.
I'm using a, a stone that uh, I use the honing machine. The reason I'm using one of these stones is because they break down faster and stay sharp longer. And I'm using some honing machine oil on the stone. I see, okay. That's a, what's the number on that? Is that a 63? Or? This is a 65. 65 out of the honing machine. Yeah. And you're working that, um, that front end of that curve, yeah. curve with that by that's, hand. That's correct. I have a little mark on that stone to show me how far I should go back in the, in the barrel. I see. You know from your previous work about how far that choke cone is in there, where that curve is. I have measured it already. Of course, you can see it. The step is an inch and a half from the muzzle, so I, I go back about an inch and seven sixteenths, not quite to the step. Well, your eye is such that, you know, uh, you can see those curves in there with your naked eye, can you not? That's correct. I think that takes some training to do that. You have to look at a lot of gun barrels. Several thousand. Probably, yeah. You're going to do some hand polishing with the 95 stone? Yeah. And then finish it up on the machine, huh? Mm-hmm. Good morning. We're going to uh, we're going to set a barrels here this morning, huh, Bill? Yeah. I wanted to uh, I wanted to show them. We have a, a beautiful set of Damascus barrels that were built for a Karl Sraba of Heidelberg. Uh, the name is gold inlaid in here. We've got some gold line work around the uh, around the uh, breech end of the barrels and nice engraving. And um, you're, I understand you're going to take these barrels completely apart now mm -hmm. and put them back together, show them how that's well, done. Later on, yeah. Uh, and you're going to give them a demonstration of how to raise a dent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can do that too. And you're going to put the dent in there to begin with? Yeah, I'll put a dent in Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to bite you. Well, I need a bigger hammer. See that dent? Yep. Sure enough, a dent. <laughs> Can you see that dent in the in the in the in the camera? Okay. Well, I'm going to take that dent out. I have a dent razor that uh, made oh. A long time ago, I don't know how long ago, and uh, I use a little pad that can be lifted up on a tapered wedge. So <coughs> I'll come out here with this thing and measure from the chamber to the dent. Let me go in there, right there. Another one of those. I have a guide on here to keep this thing in the center of the bore. you feel that? Now I'll turn this thing up, uh, oh, let's, let's try about eight thousandths of an inch. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What do you know? You just raised that net right out of there. You just come right out? I can still feel just a little bump in there. And I can tell by the dial on this uh, knob that I'm turning that it's, 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 been, it's up about three or four thousandths of an inch. It'll spring back a little bit. Now that's on one. It's one, two, three, four, five thousandths of an inch. Now I'm going to back it off now. Did you make this tool yourself, Bill? Yeah. 
There's another tight spot right there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Back it off again. Yeah, I've raised that thing about a, a thousandth of an inch. Now we come back there again. Now it's on number two. So I'll go back and get five more. You're, uh, it's bringing back. You're just, you're feeling for the, for the, for the high spot. That's correct. And, uh, I moved that high spot, that dent in, I moved it out a little, maybe a thousandth or two. But we've got to come up here again. There's four thousand, <coughs> five, six, seven. Let's see what that does to it. Every bear is a little bit different. I mean, when I'm going to do a barrel will spring back three thousandths of an inch. Another gun barrel won't spring back any more than one or two. Now it's pretty smooth in there. I can, I can just barely feel where that dent was. Maybe less than a thousandth of an inch. And I'm rotating this thing as I go back and forth. And I can just barely feel just a little quite a roughness in there. Well do you have to rotate around the circumference of the barrel also to uh uh, or just uh, basically under the dent? Basically on the dent. On the dent. If you look in the barrel, you can't see it. You're right. Do you see anything in there? No. Nope. You can't. You can just barely feel. The, it's almost just like a scratch where the... Yeah, that's a scratch from the whatchamacallit. Yeah. Now, uh, the only objection I have to these sliding dent razors or using plugs is that uh, is that uh, the dent will spring down after you get the thing out. Mm. I have those two for guns that have been badly damaged and this he's putting the bore and then you hammer on this until it comes out there and straightens out the dent. Hmm. But then the dent will spring back a little bit I when see. you take it out. I made these things up uh, when I first started gunsmithing. You couldn't buy them. I don't know if you're going to buy them yet. But they do make a hydraulic dent razor like this other one. Oh, I that see. That gunsmiths can buy. Okay. And uh, they should really have one if they want to do much shotgun work. Now, in regards to this dent, sometimes I will use a small piece of brass and tap on this thing a little bit like that. Or I might even use a piece of aluminum. Anything that's real soft that won't mar the, the, the board, but I will do that while I've got the pad in there. Uh huh. It doesn't take much tapping to uh, make the outside conform. Out when you have the pad in there. So you're making the, the outside contour conform yeah, also. It, it helps just a little bit. Okay. Okay. I'm going to put these things away and then we will... Uh, you're going to heat that barrel up and... Uh, heat the barrel up. And strip it out. And uh, take the ribs off. You put this out of the way. These barrels are uh, <clears throat> nearly all soft soldered, but I guess a few are silver soldered. Is that correct? I yes, I have seen uh, barrels silver soldered together. <coughs> In that case, you can't take them apart. I can't. Uh, Now, what do you let mean? me see this <coughs> You're, uh, little tank. Locked up on the fore-end uh, lug, yeah. lug. Yeah, let me get this thing over here. This is a small acetylene tank. This is plain acetylene. This does a pretty good job of helping to take the ribs off.
think about it. Brewers have uh, problems at times, don't they, when they get uh, the barrels a little hot? Uh, they do. Uh, ribs leak air and that uh, uh, leak water in, inside the, between the, uh, the barrels. And then when they put their bluing solution on, the water inside leaks out and it losses up their bluing job. Okay, there comes the. There comes the rib. There comes the rib. There she comes. Round and round she goes. I didn't even know there was a bottom rib. <laughs> yeah, it's the fun. The barrel's a little thicker up here and it takes a little more heat, a little longer. Some of that excess solder, so it'll be a little easier for us to put this thing back together. You may have noticed we've had to switch barrels from the, uh, the original set we started with. Uh, the problem being there that uh, those barrels were apparently not soft soldered. And they were Damascus barrels too. This goes to show you, <laughs> you never get through learning a whole lot of shotgun. Right? Got to, I hope you've got enough to put these back together now. You're going to need that acetylene to put them back together well, also. I, I use a different rig for that. Oh, okay, okay. A different rig only goes for that. I have uh, Rob the uh, machine and cut this on the TV, has he? Yeah. Yeah, the cameras are grinding. Well, maybe you can run over there and get me a next bestest block. It's underneath that bench. It's about that long and about that wide. <coughs> can you get that, Rob? Okay. Yeah. 
Now let's take a look at this butter off of the end part of the rib. <coughs> Turn it around. Just yeah, just hold it with spare pliers. That would be that's a good idea. Couple of nice blocks on the bench here, so that the fire has a little bit. So one of the first things that I do, I think the barrel to cool off a little bit now, is to uh, it's not very cool yet. However, this will give you an idea of what we uh, have to do before we put the ribs back together on the barrels. I take a couple of uh, steel scales. One. Incidentally, are those uh, monoblock? No. Yeah, I think they, they should be. It looks like it. Monoblock barrels. Steel scale here on the on the on the barrel by the and another one down here is the muzzle. We see how they line up. They're just about perfect. Take a look at that, Howard. Yeah, they're very close, but they're not, yeah. they're not exact. Okay. Now we have to do something about that. Because the left barrel is a little bit low. Right. Now they're loose at the muzzle. I see that. Get that solder off. Now are you going to uh, realign them and then clamp them back in place and then re-solder? That's, that's correct. I'm going to realign these barrels. Move that camera over there, that middle one. Be better. This is a, kind of a spring clamp that I have made to help me with this chore. I'm going to put that back up there in the middle so it will balance out. How they look that, uh, they look smack on to me. Okay, let me check it. Keep your eyes better than mine. That's perfect. Now let me take this off. re them? Now they have to be resided to the muzzle. Re 
and you do this is because if you put those ribs on, you can't do anything after the ribs are put on. Hmm. And you have to do this before. This is wire solder. It's an alloy of 95% uh, tin and 5% silver. That is called state, it's all state 430 soft silver solder. They use this in industry on stainless steel and uh, other products that will not accept the half and half solder, half tin and half lead. So we'll uh, get the plugs out here. Flux in there. This 430 solder that I use, it has a tensile strength four times greater than half and half solder. And I have never had a rib come loose that I have used this material on. Very carefully, get the puddle out of it. Now it's time for that to cool off for a few minutes. I'm checking the the area on the rib that was soft sided to the barrel to see if I can detect any any rust spots. This rib appears to be in very good condition, and it was a good soldering job in the beginning. Now, if there were rust spots there, you'd want to see that uh, have, there are any holes you'd have to repair them before I'd you... I'd have to clean it up so that it would, it would uh, hold the solder. And you see, here's a little rust spot here. I'm going to take a file and clean that up. Tinning compound is, uh, is made by the same people that make the, the solder. And one of the um, outstanding features of this tinning compound is that after it's been heated, all the acid chemicals that are in the uh, compound become neutralized. In industry, they don't have much time to spend it cleaning and, and uh, neutralizing acids and things like that in their products. Well, they have a, a, a product in this tinning compound, but they don't have to do that. It saves them a lot of time. In as much as this is kind of a light piece of metal, we don't need quite as big a flame. See there? See it go? Yeah, it's just starting to go. Real good. A little bit of solder here. Right there, a rust. You file off the rust, then it'll take the tin, and that way you're, you're sure of getting a a good uh, seal when you solder it back on, huh? That is correct. Now, if you had to do some work on these barrels, you would have uh, 
taking them apart also. Not down here, I, I never do that. I don't take them, separate the barrels. I only separate the ribs from the barrels. I so this see. has been put together with a brazing compound and uh, it takes a lot of heat <coughs> to uh, separate them. Uh, if they're uh, chopper lump barrels, then you still uh, don't pull them apart? No, I don't. Pull them. How about if you need to replace uh, uh, the, barrel? the barrel, can you pull it out of the monoblock? Uh, if I do a monoblock job, I take the barrel off right here. Take this damaged barrel off. If this barrel was damaged, I would take it off right here and put the other barrel on and sleeve it inside this chamber. Mm -hmm. Which is what, what was done originally, right? It looks like it was a monoblock job, yeah. How are the chomper lump uh, barrels attached then? Are they uh, chomper lump too? Silver soldered? Yeah, they're silver soldered together, or they call it a brazing together with some uh, brass flux. Uh huh. They uh, <coughs> the, the uh, right and left barrel and the lump. Is there? Uh, do you think there's anything to to to, to choose between the uh, the monoblock system and the chopper lump system? Uh, the chopper lump tubes are much more expensive to make. They got the lump right on the barrel before the action, and uh, the monoblock they make this they, all out they of one mill piece. This and then they make this out of one piece and then sleeve the barrels into the uh, the monoblock. Well, is the is the the, the chomper lump seems to be the preferred system, but is it, is it really? Does it have some advantages? Is it stronger? Uh, it's stronger and it's a lot more expensive. Well, we can do about without the expense, but... Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it seem to be perfectly all right. They make the... Uh, the... Uh, the, uh, the chopper, the uh, monoblox thing, out of very good steel, excellent steel. And it's done in a, a mass production uh, procedure that uh, reduces the cost. Well, is there any advantage, though, to the uh, chomper lump? They're stronger. Are they? They're stronger and uh, much more expensive. It's according to what the, uh, the arguments that the chopper lump people will give you. Most of your your uh, better quality English guns are all chopper lump uh, construction. That's that is correct. How about the Merkel? Merkel, uh, I think they're chopper lump tubes too. I have to look at the one of them to remember. That. I believe the uh, the Beretta side lock, the SO series, however, is uh, a monoblocked. They're monoblocked. Yes, Beretta makes their guns with a monoblock system. And they're all right. I've never seen anybody have any trouble with them. And they've sold millions of guns, practically. Now let's see, while that cools off, if we can do the same thing to the, the top ribbons. I looked at that, and it's pretty... Looks real good. What percentage uh, silver does uh, a conventional silver solder have that they... Uh, None at all. None whatsoever. It's half tin and half lead. <laughs> that's a standard silver solder? That's a standard, that's a standard soft solder. Oh, what does a silver solder have? Silver solder is all uh, silver. It's an alloy of silver. Oh. And this is tin with 5% just the... silver to give it uh, the, the tensile strength. I see. They have been able to flux tin into the a solder, into the, but they have been able to flux silver into the tin. I see. To make this, for a long time they couldn't flux nickel into aluminum, but they developed chemicals finally to do that with. Mm -hmm. These are uh, some of the uh, 
advantages of using uh, industrial products with your work. Now we're going to tin the top part of this rib. Once you get the temperature just right, this stuff kind of runs just like water. I originally got this, these products many years ago from a welding, Victor welding equipment. Where you can get them now, I really don't know. But any good welding supply place should have uh, a similar product, maybe under a different trade name, um, that'll do the job just as good as this product does. This uh, piece of solder I have in my hand here is uh, one sixteenth of an inch wire, they call it. It comes in a spool, a pound spool. And it used to cost about 25 bucks a pound. I don't know what it costs now. But I haven't bought any for about 15 years. You try and brush this off very lightly so that it will uh, not wipe all your solder off. It's possible, and you don't want too many lumps holding your work up. What's going on here? Mm-hmm. Let's let this cool now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now I'm going to go through the process of uh, cleaning these barrels up for the solder, for the soldering job. And they've got to be pretty clean, otherwise the solder won't stick. And we'll have a problem in the future that we don't want. I use a Luxite cloth for no particular reason except that I have always bought it in preference to emery cloth. It, it breaks down. A little bit and gives you a better polished surface than emery cloth. Emery cloth leaves some pretty deep scratches and things. And with an old file that I have had around here, I I uh, go down here and clean up the whole area where there's been solder or bluing. In that bluing, it's a rusting process, and there is rust and your solder will not stick to anything that has rust on it. I don't care how careful you, you try to solder it. If it's got rust on it, the solder won't stick. 
still have the the clamp in the muzzle that I originally used to, align to keep the barrels aligned. And there's a bridge in between the barrels here. That is, uh, this is a bridge right here. Uh, many doubles will have a bridge in here to keep the barrels from being pulled in while the ribs are being soldered on. This is the forearm lug. Right now we're putting some flux on this bottom rib and we put the fixtures on the barrel and put the bottom rib in place. <coughs> well the fixtures are uh, another of your own design, huh? That's right. We'll lay down it pretty tight now. Inside the next fixture, there's it's spring loaded so that you have tension on these parts. This is a piece of uh, flat drill rod, three thirty seconds by three eighths. Now we loosen one of these, tighten the other one, and bring that over to the center. Wait a minute. Get that to come down. Wait a minute, not too much now. This is a, uh, a welding heating head arrangement that I have had extensions made for. Uh, this is a heating head uh, unit right here, and these extensions are just pieces of copper tubing with the heating head elements all here at the end. Just uh, work it back and forth in there till that solder melts. How long does that take, Bill? Well, only a couple of minutes. And down there, the walls of the chamber are pretty thick, so I have to give that just a little more heat. Well, you've got both top and bottom ribs clamped on and now they'll join simultaneously with the barrels as you heat the barrels now. Right. Now once you've finished with uh, the main heating elements then you come back and pick up any sp any spots you missed uh, by hand then, huh? This way? Mm -hmm. I can see the solder flowing all up and down the barrel rib yeah. here. It's, it's yeah. in there. Yep. After having touched up by hand, then uh, once it cools, you uh, take it out of your fixtures and uh, clean it up uh, and uh, do whatever polishing would be uh, necessary to go to the bluing tank. That is right. So we're finished. Very good. Thank you, Bill. My pleasure. Well, Bill, uh, it's been a great couple of weeks, and uh, certainly uh, I'd like to thank you for, uh, you and Beverly, for putting up with me uh, for that period of time. Um, one final point, if anyone needs additional information or needs some help, I guess, uh, all they need to do is contact the guild, who will get in touch with you, and uh, you'll get whatever help uh, is needed back to them then, huh? That'll be fine. Okay. I want to take this opportunity to thank the American Custom Gunmakers Guild for their interest in preserving the art of uh, gunsmithing and gun making. 
My gratitude also to uh, uh, Dwayne Wiebe, Mr. Steve Billup, and Howard Clark for their countless hours to produce this tape and the manuscript, which I hope will be helpful to other gunsmiths when working on shotguns. Thank you, Bill. I'm sure it will. And I, too, would like to take this opportunity to thank you on behalf of the uh, American Custom Gunmakers Guild who sponsored the project. Uh, I know it was an imposition on you, but uh, I think we've got a product that we can be proud of and uh, will uh, serve uh, future generations of gunsmiths very well. So thank you. My pleasure.